Hey, it's Dave Brown here, host of Now with Dave Brown on AMI. Check out this latest highlight from the show. Here's something that surprises no one. Ontario is struggling to meet accessibility targets set nearly 20 years ago. What's truly surprising is how much the province is struggling. Rich Donovan put together a report on the state of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. He gave it to the government earlier in 2023, and the government released it right before the holidays. The bottom line, Donovan feels the government should declare a crisis. He also suggested sweeping changes in monitoring progress of the AODA. Let's get some perspective. Elizabeth Moeller is the founder of VM Disability Consulting. Marco Pasqua is the co-founder of Meaningful Access Consulting. Elizabeth, hello to you again. Hello to you again, Dave. And Marco, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Marco, you get the first crack at this. You brought the story sure. uh, to our attention over the holidays. What's your takeaway from this fourth review of the AODA? Yeah, so Dave, I mean, as you say, uh, it's the fourth review. So this has been vetted several times. Donovan actually points out that the Ont Ontario was actually required to monitor the compliance of over 400,000 organizations through this. And in his interim report, he found that they only hired around 20 to 25 staff to handle this, uh, which is leading to minimal on-site uh, audits. Uh, CBC did a great follow-up report on this. Um, now they require the ministry requires a lot of self certification and the honor system for a lot of small businesses, which I'm sure you can understand why that would be an issue when it comes to non compliance. And actually, Donovan uh, recommends that we move all of the uh, sort of accessibility regulation things to the, of the private sector to the federal government, which I kind of agree from a perspective of unification of the standards and kind of going across the board uh, mm. in our country with the Accessible Canada Act. Because my concern as a British Columbian is if we can't learn from these uh, reports for the AODA, how the heck are we supposed to implement this uh, accessibility standards across the country, even though the Accessible Act currently only touches on federal regulated organizations and entities right now. We are eventually going to have to prepare for other organizations and businesses across our country to be ready for being accessible for everybody. And so I really think that, you know, this underscoring of Rich Donovan's report um, is not an overstatement, in my opinion. Elizabeth, I share a similar thought with Marco here that you've heard from a lot of uh, organizations and governments as they move forward with either their provincial disability legislation or the Accessible Canada Act, how they used the AODA as a bit of a framework. And I, this is really discouraging to me that 20 years <laughs> later, what was proposed as the framework is utterly failing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you mentioned the timeline. So even just simple things like, you know, here in Toronto, a number of our transit stations are still not accessible, or the fact that in 2022, the education standard and the health standard, those regulations were submitted to the ministry by the standards development committees, and they're still not implemented uh, over, you know, over a year later. That That's a huge sort of failing on, on that part and a, and a really big problem. Uh, you know, I think the other, and Marco pointed out the numbers, right, like 20 to 25 people to monitor 400,000 businesses. But the other thing that, that I would like to see is more, um, you know, proactive education enforcement. The uh, Accessible Campus has done a really great job through the Council of Ontario Universities of actually putting together resources, toolkits, um, tip sheets, education for post-secondary education uh, institutions mm. whose whose um, you know where the standards fall under them to to help them so that they can be compliant and that they are so that they are following those standards. But I'd like to see more sectors um, taking that up. I think that's a really big piece. It's important so we don't have to define or um, you know break those mm. break those. Marco, like I said, it's, it's certainly discouraging to read this report, especially in a sense when Donovan is putting forth ideas of radically changing the framework, the way it's monitored, mm -hmm. the way it's reported, the way it's executed. So that's obviously yeah. discouraging 20 years in. But as I flip that coin on myself, I would prefer they get it right. Like even if it means changing course and delaying and delaying reaching of goals, it's better to get it right than say we're working inside a broken framework just to hit a timeline that they're not going to hit anyway. Well, exactly. And, you know, when people visit the United States, they're always talking about the um, Americans with Disabilities Act. And I mean, that was implemented in the 90s. Now, I can tell you there's 
glaring gaps when you go there in 2023, 2024 uh, into the States, I should say, you know, to see where we can make these changes and these fixes. And this is our opportunity as Canadians to do exactly that, Dave. What you're saying is let's get this right, right out the gate. Let's make sure that businesses understand. And if we want to tr create true allies in the situation, it's not just to slap them on the, the wrist with compliance without them understanding the reasons why. There is a real return to businesses' bottom line if they actually make their businesses more accessible. Go figure. <laughs> yeah. Elizabeth, I want to give you an opportunity to express a little bit of optimism as well here, because certainly the easy reaction is like, this is horrible, and I don't want to talk about it or think about it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one thing I would say just to, to touch on the proactivity is, you know, the, these timelines are great 2025 or 2040 for the Accessible Canada Act, but they're benchmarks and accessibility is a process. We're always going to be coming, you know, more accessible as technology changes, as infrastructure changes. Yep. So they're benchmarks, but knowing that, you know, accessibility is an ongoing effort and even those those timelines and targets um, are great benchmarks and they're great standards, but that we're always moving because accessibility is fluid. fluid. It's a, It's a process. Let's change tracks here. Via Rail Canada, they updated their website in December. It was a bit of a shock to me because I don't like change. <laughs> but in the end, I had a pretty good experience booking some holiday travel, and the travel went quite well. So uh, big flowers for Via Rail right now. Elizabeth, what strikes you about this update and general accessibility policies at Via? I'm actually excited. I'm optimistic. So I too booked. I had a really positive experience. I was able to pick my own seat. I was able to actually select um, that and then say that I was legally blind and required assistance. That was great that I didn't have to wait on hold for an hour to do that. So I really appreciated that. The infrastructure was really accessible in terms of just using a screen reader. Um, I also was on one of the new fleets. And one of the things that I really liked was the call button that I could call for an attendant. I have almost been left mm -hmm. in London because there was no one in my car oh, wow. and the doors don't open at every car at every uh, car so being able to call and and get someone's attention was great the washrooms were bigger um having braille so uh certainly too the other thing i liked was the announcements for for people that were hard of hearing or deaf they were they were um visual as well so i'm like i'm liking it i'm feeling optimistic and i'm feeling like our needs were actually taken into account when when via made these these sweeping changes Hey, Marco, I know the train situation is a little bit different out there on the West Coast because, you know, there's an ocean that's always getting in the way and Rocky Mountains are <laughs> yeah, always getting the... in the way. But what's your experience Pesky. been like with uh, with passenger train travel? Uh, to be quite honest, I actually haven't been on a passenger train yet, Dave, outside of, you know, uh, the SkyTrain in Vancouver. Uh, however, I know that our, our uh, colleague Grant Hardy a couple of years ago did a segment on uh, um, AMI this week. I think it was called Have Kane Will Travel. And he talked at that time, it was about six years ago, about the accessible train cars that were coming. Now, I have good news in that in September, I'm actually a keynote speaker in New Brunswick. And so I'll probably be taking the train at that time. Oh, cool. um, so I'll be able to give you an update cool. as well as in the summer I'm going to Switzerland where my wife uh, his family is all from and lives currently and so I'll be taking train travel there as well. Now going through Europe on train and, and checking the accessibility is going to be a really interesting adventure for me but I'm optimistic uh, because of all the things that I've seen and I did hear that years ago Via Rail was implementing a lot more accessibility when it comes to the actual um, you know uh, train cars themselves. Yeah. Um, you know if you, if you plan in advance that is and you make sure that you're in the right space and the right place so that's really cool yeah you know it's 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 not like you know there's no such thing as 100 percent a plus across the board but elizabeth i know sure. via rail was very intentional about yes. disability consultation on the front yeah. end of developing these cars and they deserve a lot of credit for that no, absolutely. And you can you can tell because the things just make sense. Sometimes accessibility, um, you know, you can tell that it was put in place sort of afterwards and you're, and you're thinking this doesn't make sense. Like, why is there Braille on drive through ATMs? But this you can really tell that, that this was done in a very thoughtful, meaningful way. All right, one last story to get to here, and this one comes from my own meandering personal experience. I bought some new bedroom furniture over the holidays because I am an adult, and uh, I was sleeping on the floor like a frat boy. So I initially tried to do some of it online. I couldn't do it, though. I had to go to the store and actually touch things. What's the point of buying a dresser or a bureau if you don't know how slidey the drawers are? So how am I supposed to buy something if I haven't at least slid them back and forth and touched them? Maybe I'm weird, but it also begs this question. Marco, in the modern retail landscape where so many things are moving online, what's something that you just can't buy online? 
Well, so, I mean, three things. Uh, you heard me talk about accessible clothing a couple of segments ago. Clothing, I still think, even though you can buy it online, it does. you don't know if it's going to fit right unless you try it on in-store or at least try and make sure it's the right fit for you. The next one would be mattresses because if you're going to spend that kind of money, you want to make sure that it feels good before it enters uh, your home. And then the last one that I've learned in the last couple of months is refrigerators. Um, they're not all created mm. equal. And uh, the height and the depth is a real challenge because those change and fluctuate depending on the model. So you have to really check your cutouts and make sure from an accessibility perspective, you don't want something that's so deep that it's actually going to impede your space in your kitchen. So just a, a heads up to everybody, you want to <laughs> check your fridges out in person. <laughs> So this prompted the daily poll. So Elizabeth and I already kind of batted this back and forth in the first hour of the show. But Elizabeth, I did reveal and tell on myself about the walk-in contradiction that I am. Because even though I went to the store and had to touch the bureau, I still went home and bought it online. So even even my premise oh. I can quibble with on my on my own front end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say workout equipment for me as well. Like a trampoline, I gotta know how bouncy it is. I want to bounce a treadmill. I want to try it. And then I would also say, kind of along your vein of furniture, water beds. When I upgrade my water bed, I always want to go and test it at the water bed world and just see how much you know waviness there is. You can't measure waves online. Wow. You just can't. <laughs> I, I I really feel like we should go visit Elizabeth's apartment. Water beds and trampolines. Yes. Like this sounds awesome. <laughs> it sounds Anytime, like we're actually Dave. in. Tom Hanks' big movie, exactly, <laughs> yeah. right? Anytime, anytime. <laughs> Childhood heart through and through. Hey, Elizabeth, thank you for this. Thank you for pinch hitting as a co-host today as well. Have a lovely weekend. No problem, Dave. You as well, Dave. And Marco, all the best to you. Enjoy a weekend out there in British Columbia. Thank you so much, sir. That's Marco Pasqua. He's the co-founder of Meaningful Access Consulting. Elizabeth Moeller is the founder of EM Disability Consulting. Do you want to dive into more conversations like this? Watch Now with Dave Brown weekdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on AMI-tv or download the podcasts wherever you listen. Do you want to dive into more conversations like this? Watch Now with Dave Brown weekdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on AMI-tv or download the podcasts wherever you listen.